Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I've got a great guest with me here today, Gabriella Hoffman. She's a freelance media strategist and an award-winning writer and a columnist for townhall.com. Gabriella, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Brad. It's great to talk to you. Excited to explore more topics. Yeah, look, I, I'm excited to have you on. I follow the work that you do. Uh, we, we write about some of the same stuff when it comes to independent, independent contracting and freelancing and free market economics. Uh, and, and so I followed your work on that, but we had a conversation a little while ago over Twitter and I really wanted to talk to you about this. I learned that your family is actually from Lithuania uh, and, and fled basically USSR occupation. So can you just tell listeners a little bit about your background and where your family's from and what it was like? I would be happy to, absolutely. I think one of the common misconceptions people have of my story is they think I was born there and I fled with my parents. I didn't come into the picture until like five years later, but my parents and my grandparents who are no longer here, but at the time when they were still around, and then my aunt and a few other relatives, they all came uh, from the Soviet Union or Soviet occupied Lithuania at the height of Reagan's second term. And I love talking about that and being a conservative, it's all great to be intermixed with that. But my parents saw firsthand, especially in post-Stalin occupied Soviet Union, Lithuania, what can happen when government gets too big or when government controls basically every facet of your life. And unfortunately, a lot of my relatives, my grandparents on both sides, especially on my mother's side, got to sadly endure the brunt of Stalin's reign of terror. One of my grandpas, my maternal grandpa, survived 18 months in one of Stalin's gulags, and that story is very harrowing to this day. He's one of millions of people from the Baltics and even the other countries that were occupied by the Soviet Union who were exiled. And if people don't know about the gulag system and how oppressive and evil it was, I definitely recommend they study up on it. So I'm a descendant of a gulag survivor. Not many people in the Baltics or Eastern Europe had that ability to survive if they were lucky to. My grandpa was a farmer and he had this, the will and the strength to endure that crazy condition. It was a gulag at the Russian Finnish border built on the bones of humans, human prisoners to be exact. And it's at the Belomar Canal for reference. And you hear those images. And, and I also hear about my parents' experiences growing up behind the Iron Curtain, although a little less, I would say oppressive. It was still re really bad, obviously, not discounting that. But it wasn't as treacherous and worrisome so much, but you still had to be paranoid about what you say. You had to obviously worry about still the lack of opportunity, kind of being a sovereign individual. You couldn't really openly still have private property for the most part. The government would put you up in different housing situations. And if you did own land, it was very small and, and it wasn't determined for you how much you could and couldn't own. So having, yeah. yeah, so having obviously heard the stories, having visited Lithuania myself, I was nine years old when I first went. I haven't gone in 20 something years just due to life being busy. But I saw firsthand kind of what the country is. I, I met relatives. I met my grandparents on my mom's side. I got to see where they grew up, obviously see Lithuania post-Soviet. And now today you look to the country and it really is one of the leading countries in Europe, uh, kind of against the grain of the EU in being really independent, very pro-free market and very skeptical of China even. I think Lithuania is one of the most outspoken countries condemning China's crimes against the Uyghurs just their different machinations. And so it's always been a leader, having been the first country that was occupied to formally declare its independence in the 1990s, early 1990, uh, to do that. So Lithuania has always been kind of independent and I am really lucky to say that those kind of qualities and principles that are ingrained in Lithuanian culture, are kind of this Lithuanian-ness uh, nationality and kind of the ideals, you know, you obviously have a reverence for free enterprise, skepticism of big government and collectivism by extension, because those two thoughts are very anathema to what Lithuanian culture is. It's always been a largely independent country. And when they were occupied by both the Nazis and the communists, they felt like that freedom was taken away from them. And they've always hated those systems. It doesn't get talked about much, unfortunately, but they really just hated the dual occupancy and occupation from those two evil regimes. But a lot of historians will say, well, they were sympathetic to fascists or they're insufficiently this, but that's a lot of whitewashing. And I try my best to educate people about the history and obviously combining it with my being American, I was actually the first person in my immediate family born in the US, which is an honor I wear very proudly. 
I tried to share my family's story. I've chronicled it a little bit through my column at Town Hall when I first started writing for them. And I tried to do it now that I've returned and kind of am more so a consistent columnist with them in an official capacity. I've also written about it for different publications. I've had my dad come on my conservation podcast to talk about just how government was restrictive and very much against conservation for hunting and fishing in his ancestral homeland. So it's a really interesting culture. Uh, there are only 1 million Americans who hold some semblance of Lithuanian heritage, interestingly enough. So it sounds exotic. It's kind of on the cutting edge. It's a country that more people will be hearing about. And I hope other Americans learn about the history and actually a lot of the shared similarities between our two nations and how we've always been actually a fairly reliable ally of theirs and they've been a fairly reliable ally of ours. So a lot of commonalities and people don't know this actually, Lithuania today, kind of against our education system, interestingly enough, when you put those two together, kids that are 16 and 17 actually are required to learn about free markets. And we don't see that in high schools here much, unfortunately, but Lithuania, they made it so with actually the fee, current fee president when he was president of the Lithuanian Free Market Institute, Jovinas Selenas. Uh, when he was president of the organization, he was shepherding that. And uh, kids have to learn about it. And you find among actually a lot of young people in Lithuania today, they're, they speak English fluently, all the while still speaking Lithuanian. And they're very anti-communist, anti-socialist, actually, compared to a lot of young people here. So that's kind of Lithuania in a nutshell, my family story in a nutshell, even from kind of a contemporary edge. And yeah, I just hope more people kind of learn about it. And uh, we try to emulate them. If mm -hmm. we want to emulate some country in Europe, I think for the most part, we can try to emulate them in, in some regards. Yeah, and I want to talk more about Lithuania because it sounds like they really, your family and, and Lithuania more broadly, experienced some really horrible stuff. Mm -hmm. And they saw the perils of big government and communism and socialism up close. And they're really uh, they're not pretty. But most people, yeah. I feel like, don't actually know this. Uh, particularly, you know, you, you look at polling today and see young people favorable to socialism or communism or communist leaders from history. I feel like they, they're just not in touch with this, they, right? They didn't grow up during the Cold War. The Soviet Union ended before many young people today were even born. But in Lithuania, where they have this history and they know, they've really, you were telling me, they've raced to the opposite extreme. So can you tell us about how they've embraced free markets and capitalism and economic freedom and small government in the country that, that used to suffer under the opposite? I think it was to be expected, actually, of such a country Prior to World War One and World War II, they were actually pretty prosperous. And I was telling you before we recorded, it was one of kind of the earliest fashions of democracy under the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. That was actually one of the largest countries in Europe in, I believe it was the 15th century, 16th century. I'm probably jumbling the dates, but it was prior to obviously the American Revolution. And they've always had like commerce. They've always been really culturally advanced. Um, there used to be a lot of interesting heritage to it. Actually, it was the last country to become Christian in Europe, interestingly enough, people don't know that. And there's actually still a pretty big kind of pagan uh, aspect to Lithuanian culture, but it's not like really witchcraft or anything, but it's, it's an interesting thing to see. Um, you have like these places like Witch Mountain and some other things intermixed with their kind of Christian heritage as well. So you see a lot of interesting history. There were famous knights and kings and dukes and things of that sort. And when you go to Lithuania today and see how modern it is, you see skyscrapers mixed with these really kind of old world architecture and buildings. And all these different buildings had a lot of history to them, good and bad, obviously. And Napoleon at one time w was admiring some of Lithuania's churches. So you had all these different people, conquerors, travelers, notable experts, they would go there and they would be fascinated by the country. And I think you see a resurgence of that today. I'm not sure how closely our government is really looking to, or maybe some scholars are looking to Lithuania for maybe replicating certain economic policies here. And I will say it's not perfect. I think they do some things worse than us. I think a lot of us could be skeptical of that taxes. They probably rely more so on a welfare state. And they're, they're a little bit different in terms of us, I would say, uh, politically. I would say conservatism there is not as well defined. You find more fiscal conservatism, maybe not so much social conservatism, or you may find elements of libertarianism actually emerging there. But actually, the government right now is largely young. It's pretty forward thinking. You see a lot of, I would say, perhaps Republican or libertarian equivalent policies starting to percolate there. Uh, they're certainly mindful of their history. 
And I think they could teach us in terms of all the horrors that they endured. And you see actually a lot of people coming into power in Lithuania who had family members who endured a lot of the hardships or their grandparents did or someone in their family knew exactly what could be at stake. And I think it would be contradictory for Lithuanians to embrace collectivism. Sadly, some American Lithuanians, there's actually a professor from Columbia you may have seen who talked about how capitalism actually causes mental illness, depression, and all these other uh, problems. And I would say Lithuanians or those who are in the diaspora of kind of the American Lithuanian community who are removed from the horrors, sadly, are very susceptible to these kind of big government thinking. And for me, I was different. My parents partly wanted me to not be like that because we've had some family members go in that direction, unfortunately. But also I saw it for myself and I was able to challenge my conservative beliefs in college and even now and test it against kind of these leftist theories. I'm not accepting of them, but I always like to see what the other side says. Obviously, I think it's healthy to know exactly who you're up against and, and how to tackle and deconstruct their theories and their positions. But yeah, it's... Uh, it's super interesting just to see that because my family, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty not removed from the horrors. I remember hearing the stories, like I only got to meet my grandpa once, but my parents would say like he was just so scarred by his experience, his imprisonment. He never wanted to share his thoughts. And I said, well, why didn't he? And they're like, well, it was a different time. You don't really share stories kind of in contrast to like Holocaust survivors who, while it was very painful for them too, to share their stories, you saw more Holocaust survivors sharing their stories. But survivors of communism and socialism, they're starting to share more. Our mutual friend, Daniel DiMartino, he's kind of from this newer iteration of socialism, kind of this new mm -hmm. survivor of it. You see it playing out in Central and South America more commonly, still inklings of it in North Korea. And even by extension, I would say communist China. <laughs> There's nothing really free market about it because the government controls their economy. It's a state-sponsored uh, economy, very much so. And... I mean, there are different waves of kind of like anti-communism and sadly anti-communism. And I know some people kind of view that as a dirty word, but kind of education about communism and its horrors doesn't really get the same shake as even Holocaust education. But we even see people starting to denounce uh, any attempts to actually highlight what happened in the Holocaust. You see Holocaust deniers are still common. You see more and more young people actually not knowing what um, Auschwitz was or what the Holocaust was or how many people died. They questioned the death statistics of those who were victimized there. So we have the same problem with educating people about communism as we're starting to see sadly now, even with educating people about the Holocaust and Nazi crimes. So it's, it's a larger conversation. Groups like Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation do a phenomenal job of trying to educate the public. They've been around since the 1990s, I think 1992, 93, when they got uh, signed off by Congress to start to operate. And they highlight victim stories. Um, I think they may even do something with my dad in the future. We're, we're possibly in the talks of doing that. But I think having people like my parents, I think my dad is more comfortable talking about his situation. He's actually really unique because people don't think of the Soviet Union as a really anti-Semitic place. And my dad is Jewish and he actually endured a lot of anti-Semitism in post-Stalin occupied Lithuania. And he talked about discrimination he faced as a Jewish individual. He was denoted in the fifth column category by the Soviet government. So they would identify you by your passport. And he experienced some pretty very egregious examples of racism. And they like to persecute minorities in the Soviet blocs. They would tackle you or they would get after you if you were a Crimean Tartar, if you were not <laughs> in their thinking. So my dad can explain, you know, how those systems that preach equality are actually really more so specialist in equitable sharing of misery, persecuting people of all faiths, backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, genders, things of that sort. So he loves to share his perspective. He's pretty impassioned about it. And I'm going to try to deploy him to do that uh, with those opportunities. But, but people like my parents who got to see it firsthand are extremely important in this discourse and educating people. And I saw that BOC is actually going to be, uh, I think, petitioning different state legislatures to, they're trying to do this in Florida to get uh, education courses that actually talk about what happened under communist bloc nations. They want to have uh, victims or survivors or a combination of those two, because obviously survivors are obviously around to talk about the story and people who may be uh, related to victims of it who were deceased uh, could talk about their experiences to younger audiences, to school-aged children, high school students, even college students. So it's encouraging to me that there is a seriousness and it's really seeped into political discourse, as you've noted, it does scare me 
that you see a lot of Democrats embracing tenants, not every tenant, but a lot of tenants that kind of harken back to the system. And it worries me because in the United States, actually, when awareness about communism was starting to be revealed, we actually had Democrat opposition to communism too. It was pretty bipartisan. And it seems like those Democrats are kind of extinct. <laughs> you don't really see them anymore. Very few, a handful are really staunchly yeah. anti-communist today. And it makes me sad. You know, I, I am very conservative and, and politically yoked in that fashion. And I hate to say that we have to blanket statement every Democrat like this, but they're going to get those attacks on them if they don't overwhelmingly come out against it and, and denounce it. It seems like some of them are very comfortable with not chastising the AOC types or Bernie Sanders for embracing democratic socialism, which is not really different from the other tried socialist variants out there. And Democrats have to have a reckoning. And I've, I've seen some people who've worked on Biden's campaign say that they are anti-communist, but I don't see much from them condemning some others in their party or their movement, uh, leftist writ large, uh, for this. And education is extremely important. And sometimes I think, unfortunately, sometimes people on our side like to use it as a cudgel to raise money. And I would never, ever subject my parents to the mercy of an organization to make money have their story compromised and and kind of watered down by someone who wants to make a quick buck. So I think sometimes on our side, we see that. And I, I really find that to be disgusting. And I would never put my parents' story up for that. I would rather tell it myself or create some sort of avenue to do it or work with trusted organizations that I feel won't exploit my parents' story. Uh, because sometimes on our side, we say that everything is socialist. And when we do that, we also kind of are guilty of sometimes what leftists do with blanket statementing things. Many things what they're pro propagating are socialist, sadly, but you can't say everything is. And we need to be a little careful, I think, with that, because that term can be overused. And then they can use that against us, weaponize that term against us when real socialist measures that they propose come about. So we have to be careful about crying wolf all the time, but we do have to be very vigilant about combating any instance of socialism or collectivism that do does come out from either this administration or members of Congress or different movements like the DSA. Yeah, so let, let's talk about this a little bit more because I'm interested when your family first came to the country and when you were growing up and you kind of had a foot in both cultures, right? With your family mm -hmm. coming from Lithuania, but you an American growing up here, what was it about American institutions and life and culture and values that they found so superior? I mean, I, I know that it's probably the case. I have a friend from college, just as an example, who, uh, is from China, and she was an international student at my college, and she was just stunned when she came here at when you went into a grocery store, how many options there were. She found out that private citizens were allowed to own guns, and she was just flabbergasted. And it was just amazing to me to watch her experience that because those are things I've kind of always taken for granted, if I'm being honest, growing up here. So for your family and for you uh, through them, what were the things about America that really stood out as is so valuable in the contrast of that dark history? That's a great point you make. And I think anyone who's lived under some semblance of it, and today a lot of people from China are coming to this country to flee that as well. Uh, because they've been critical of their government. And it's very similar to what my parents had observed when they first came here. And, you know, when they came here, they always admit, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to adjust to a new country. I think any Im legal immigrant who comes here, people who flee as political refugees, they always admit it is a challenge sometimes to adjust to a new culture. But because we're such a vested melting pot country, it, it's a lot easier than I think people believe it would be. My parents obviously kept a lot of, and they retained a lot of their cultures while assimilating to the American way of life. I think some of the first things that really surprised my parents when I was old enough to understand this, when they explained it, they said, I think by the, just the virtue of having so many different innumerable freedoms, my parents couldn't freely speak out. A lot of the populists in Soviet Union couldn't speak out against the government. So my parents were really surprised and, and very favorable to the notion that you could criticize your government openly without being jailed or persecuted or punished in some fashion. They were always impressed by how there was a potential for you to climb the economic ladder without really being stuck in classes. And I think sometimes people in our country like to use that jargon that we're stuck in classes. And when you say we're in a class, it means you're 
stuck in a, in a strata where you can't upwardly move. And we have to be careful about the language we use, I think, with respect to that. We're in economic brackets because to say that we're in classes implies that we're predetermined to be stuck in certain social strata. We can't advance up. So my parents were always impressed by the fact that through might and through grit and good work, you could rise the economic ladder. And for them, my mother had the potential to, and she actually did succeed in climbing up the ladder to work in corporate America as a technological consultant. She was a software programmer. My dad runs his own construction business to this day. And while he did face some challenges, the construction is very tied to economic upheaval or successes. Um, it's very buoyant, sadly, as an industry. So anytime there's an economic crash, construction takes a hit too. So even with their challenges and climbing up the economic ladder, they were able to live their American dream and they wish that they could do more and that they were able to make more money. Uh, but they want myself and my siblings, uh, my sister, to be able to do that now that we are uh, obviously American born, we've had more opportunities than they did, but every parent, immigrant or not, wants you to succeed. And my dad also observed something that he talked about on my podcast too, that when he was growing up in the Soviet Union, they were always told that in capitalist or free market societies, environmental situations are very perilous. He was always told that in America, that he heard this from his grandmother, some relative who said that, well, in America, they pollute everything. All wildlife is dead. The land is exhausted and polluted. But actually, they were just kind of projecting what the Soviet Union was employing in terms of policies. My dad recalls seeing a lot of dirty rivers. Industry was just polluting. They were unaccountable. And it was the government responsible for all these policies. Obviously, Chernobyl in nearby Ukraine, that was a government error. <laughs> obviously a government problem with, when it came to this environmental disaster. It wasn't a private enterprise problem. Uh, and so he was able to observe that government, when it's too heavy handed and it's not limited in nature, it can actually cause a lot of ruin for activities. And he said that you had to know someone if you wanted to get a fishing or hunting license. Over here in the United States, you don't have to do that. You can go online and buy a license and sync it to your phone. You can buy over the counter licenses to go fishing and hunting, and it's open to the public. We manage our public resources and wildlife in a very unique model where the American participants can have a say in how things are managed. Rather, in Europe, even today, sometimes it's more private, which is not a bad thing. I think you should be able to hunt private and public opportunities and fish private and public opportunities. But it's a lot more restricted. And so my dad was like, I could fish here without retribution. I don't have to pay large sums of money unless you're hunting or fishing out of state. That, but that's a little different story because every state is different. There's no universal exchange rate with many states and every state is at liberty to decide what they want to do. But it's not a comparison to what happened in the Soviet Union, obviously. But for there, the opportunities were scarce. You had to be somewhat tied to the government. Um, if you were like a government bureaucrat's friend or acquaintance, you got better privileges. So here we don't have that. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you live, your income, your status, whatever. You could go fishing and hunting. So he always makes that point to me and says, like, we're really lucky in this country to be able to do this. We pay a license fee and we can do this, stay within the creole or harvest limits, and ha we can enjoy things, take things home to eat if we want to consume things, and also enjoy time in nature. So he observed a lot how the communists would always say it's capitalist fault or free markets fault for destroying the environment, which is actually false. We have seen actually that markets and limited government and individual efforts actually do better job of cleaning and preserving the environment than let's say a rigid big government type system does, a top-down approach does. So there are a lot of different caveats and things that my parents observed when they came here that they like. And sadly, they're a little worried now today seeing kind of the infringements from government coming into different facets of life. And they never thought this would happen here. Sometimes with some of the culture war stuff, they're like, this is ludicrous. Not even some of the craziest of communist leaders would even conceive this. So kind of where we're going into now somewhat with this dystopian kind of aura with some cultural stuff. My parents are worried that we could potentially morph into this. I doubt it's ever gonna be that bad if people are vigilant and I don't wanna scare people or fear monger by any means. But if we're not careful, we could lose what we have here in this country, what makes this country great, all the freedoms we have, the Bill of Rights, the constitution, the structure of government we have. And so for them, they came here and they never thought this country could ultimately be hijacked or, or attacked from within in terms of people wanting to rid of these institutions that have made this country great and made us this beacon of hope for people from all around the world, from third world countries, uh, even people so much as wanting to come to this country illegally too. If we are so bad, why are people taking either illegal means 
or even just mm -hmm. fleeing country by boat or something in the past, like many other cultures did, Vietnamese people fleeing on, on boats to come here at the height of the Vietnam War when it was still communist in Vietnam. So people will come to this country. I think sadly the left loves to say that this is evil and oppressive yet their theory doesn't stand to, to the truth because people will come here by any means, legal and even illegal uh, to this country if it's, if it's um, so awful. I don't, I don't think they would be coming here if it was terrible. Yeah, I wanna ask you about that because I know you're very conservative, I'm more conservative mm -hmm. and we're uh, involved in the conservative movement, free market and Republican to some extent circles. Uh, but I guess I want to pick your brain on this. So it sounds from everything like your your family came uh, and were the model immigrants, great success stories. And, you know, their children now, including you, uh, are doing great, too, doing great things. But I worry uh, when I look at the modern right and the modern conservative movement that they've become not just pro border security, which I am, or pro, you know, reasonable uh, immigration enforcement, but anti-immigrant overall and really not supportive of even legal immigration do you think the right is moving in the wrong direction on on some of these immigration related issues i am a bit worried i share your concern and i've seen this directed at some congressional candidates who are interestingly enough very avid trump, trump supporters and i think you'll find this debate to take place in what is kind of this trumpist iteration of the republican party today where you'll find actually a lot of them don't like the anti-legal immigrant rhetoric coming out from some of these smaller but sadly louder voices. And I do worry, and I did something as simply as wishing one of my friends a happy freedom bursary. I love to call people's homecoming to the United States when after they've become citizens, freedom bursary. So I, I talk about that or their arrival in this country. So I, I do that every year with my parents who just celebrated their 35th freedom anniversary, as, freedom bursary as we like to call it. And I did that and for some reason, some individual, I won't give or lend credence to his name. He's not really super prominent, but I don't want to, you know, obviously elevate certain individuals if I don't have to. And he was suggesting that my congratulating my friend for being and having a freedom bursary means I'm for open borders. And if you look through and comb through my record, I've actually been pretty consistently pro-border security against amnesty. And I think that's where most reasonable people are and, and fall under but I think there are some loud elements under this national populist banner, national conservative banner, who do worry me a little bit. And they're they're welcome to communicate their thoughts, but their thoughts are not immune from criticism. That's where I think a lot of us are falling. And I think there's a growing middle ground where all of us want border security, but we don't want to restrict people who want to come here legally. And I think there is some rhetoric that is rooted in xenophobia. And I want to use that word very carefully because I know the left tosses that very casually but I do see some echoing of it. Catalina Laff, who was running against Adam Kinzinger, was the subject of some attacks by some other congressional candidate who lost overwhelmingly. And he took issue with her being half Latina. And she was like, this is crazy. I don't know what you're doing. So I think most people, let's say the future of the party, which is, I guess, embracing elements of populism, which can be good or bad. And I think you and Hannah Cox were talking about you could embrace certain elements of populism if it's done correctly. I think there's a good way to go about it and a bad way to go about it where you return it to the individual, obviously empowering the individual, not so much empowering the government. I'm fully in agreement with that notion. But you will even see among Trump supporters kind of a rejection of this nativist thinking because actually Trump grew his share of support among, believe it or not, Hispanic voters and other different right. voting blocks. So we see a lot of people who want to come to this country legally and that should be encouraged. And I think we've stepped away from this conversation of making it easier for people to come here legally. I think each year, 4 million people are backlogged with trying to get their citizenship. I've seen and I've had friends who've, I don't know, it's took them decades to, be, get, to become citizens. And that's appalling. It should not take 10 years, 14 years to become a US citizen. And then someone who just comes here by illegal means and, you know, I don't blame them and, and I disagree with the method that they came here and I can empathize with some of their desires to become American, but they should try to come here by legal means. I think that's what we should encourage. But I think you can assess all of this very individually without <laughs> appearing anti-immigrant in general. And I think the left does unfortunately a problem with lumping in people who come here illegally versus legally. They do this with guns. They do this all different issues. They lump every people together or every sector or, or kind of facet together. And we do have to be mindful of that. But I think 
I'm, I'm hopeful that this contingent that is sadly echoing this quasi xenophobic rhetoric about no legal immigration and even hating people. I don't even know why you would hate people who are of non-white backgrounds, who are conservative. We've been screaming from the rooftops for trying to expand the tent. And the fact that they're saying, well, you're not welcome here because I think Catalina had this attack on her where the guy said, because your mother came from Guatemala, you're really not American. You, It's not an idea. It, and I'm paraphrasing what this is, but he said, because her family can't trace their roots back, her family can't trace their roots back to the colonial times. You're not really American. So that will disqualify a lot of us. People. I know this was, this is an outlier, but I, I wanted to use this example, but a lot of people came to her defense, a lot of populists, a lot of MAGA conservatives, if you will call them. And there are these voices, but I think they're, they're in the minority, but we do have to draw attention to them and say, what are you talking about? Like, this is ridiculous what you're saying. And I don't think you really need to have a strong opinion one way or another on immigration. But when you see something like this, as asinine as this start to play out in discourse on the right, it needs to be called out and it needs to be condemned and, and not embraced. And some people let this go and they say, well, it's not really a problem. But what happens when it comes for them if someone doesn't like an idea and these kind of rabid, really, really, I wouldn't call them far right. I wouldn't call them right. I would just say these kind of extremist elements who try to hijack what it means to be a conservative are doing this. It's going to be a problem you're going to have to address. It's not so much about purging so many people from the party, but they're really minority extremists, like really, really small elements. There's a way to combat them and not give them a wider platform. I think that has to be addressed for sure. I'm not sure how people will, but I would hope we don't cannibalize each other as a movement, um, more big picture thinking. I think uh, there are certain things that do bring people together. I disagree with the populists' agreement with or um, notion of excommunicating libertarians. <laughs> if libertarians <laughs> were successful in uh, advancing the debt and deficit issue, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. And it's not that they're not successful, but it's it's the free market principles have not been adhered to. And I think both parties are guilty of chipping away at it, unfortunately. You see corporatism starting to become mainstream. You see big government and big business hand in hand working together. And it's very problematic. We see this in the culture wars playing out too, especially with voter ID stuff and all these different issues, them trying to electioneer and try to take a step to alienate 50% of their consumer base. And I think there are things that can unite us. I don't think you should purge people. I mean, maybe with the exception of some Lincoln Project people, <laughs> we can we can forgo having them in the coalition because they're not really conservative. But justing aside, I think there are ways to unify people. I think the Brett Kavanaugh circumstance brought the coalition together in a rare moment of unity. I think there are many things that can bring people together. And I really hate to see this kind of chasm in conservative politics where people say, well, if you don't agree with us entirely, it's our way or the highway, you're not really conservative. And I also really dislike that people are trying to change the notion of what conservatism is. I don't think conservatism needs to be rebranded. I think just better storytellers and communicators need to communicate what it exactly means. And libertarianism too, I think. I know libertarians struggle sometimes with different factions in their movement too. But I think what has fundamentally worked for conservatism is still tried and tested and, and can work. And I hate seeing the meaning or reshaped and, and re, I guess, packaged. And it loses its meaning when it's like common good conservatism or paleoconservatism or neoconservatism. There's only one conservatism. And conservatism is a lifestyle. It's not just a political ploy or political toy that you can reinvent and, and try to re-image in your own way. It's a philosophy that many of us adhere to. I try to live my life in a conservative way. Limited government, I'm a business owner, I'm a freelancer, self-employed. I try to be good to other people. I don't want the government coming and attacking me. I don't want to have my sovereignty taken away at. I want to have freedom as best as I can. I want, I'm a gun owner. I don't want to have those freedoms restricted from me. I believe that individuals and families are the best people equipped to tackle cultural issues. And there are ways to advance that, I think, going forward. And I am a little concerned that um, some people want to use the vehicle of government to promote family or to promote social conservatism, which I think is diametrically opposed to pro-life or pro-family type of ideals that never ends on any good terms, unfortunately. So we have to be careful with wanting to use government as a vehicle to advance our agenda because government you can't really trust. Um, and especially if we're going to have Democrat presidents, you don't want to be able to place your trust in them for pushing different policies. Right. So we have to be skeptical. I think there's discussions to be had. 
hopefully, I'm hopeful that traditional conservatism, which I think can be appealing to new voting blocks, is preserved. And you, I've talked to a lot of Trump supporters, people who were diehard Trump supporters, the now staffers in Congress, having worked for the campaign or administration. And they tell me that they are a little worried about some of these kind of extremist elements trying to hijack what Trump did. And they believe that Trump, minus a few things, did advance what traditional Republican governors did. He was probably more conservative than Bush in many regards. And that's what they argue. That's what they've told me. And they don't think Trumpism can be lumped in with some nationalist populist attitude. So we're going to even see that debate happening too. So I'm hopeful that the coalition and the movement can come together. We're going to need it, especially over these next two to four years, especially with all the different attacks on your right to be able to freelance, your right to own a gun, your right to uh, want to work in the energy sector or to be able to rely on oil and gas or things of that notion. So it, it's challenging times ahead. I hate that people are trying to cannibalize each other. They saw this with, I saw this with attacking Governor Nome. I thought those attacks were quite unwarranted. I don't think she's any less conservative just for wanting to uh, comb through the different meaning of her bill. And I know some people watching may disagree with it, with that notion, but I think pinning her down to, to that and, and saying she's impure because this will ruin her prospects in 2024. I don't think she's gonna run for president. I'm gonna be one of the first people to say that. I actually think there are other people and I don't know if DeSantis will either, actually, not because Trump will run, but I think there are some other people who are maybe not tied down to elected office who could emerge, maybe a Pompeo, uh, who kind of embodies a lot of what President Trump had. He was one of his most loyal foot soldiers in the administration. So I think we're going to see different conversations, but I hate that we're hinging uh, certain battles or maybe one area of disagreement to killing people's prospects for the future. So we, we can't do that. Yeah, and I think she really is adamant about protecting women's sports too. I don't think she's going to agree with the NAAC, NCAA, excuse me, and uh, with their demands. So I know it's a greater conversation with that issue, but I don't think she's any less conservative for wanting that bill to kind of work seamlessly. And I don't know what's going to happen with that bill, uh, but the NCAA said that they are going to blanket statement, um, not have any challenges to that policy where they're going to allow trans women to compete in women's sports and trans men to compete in men's sports too, I think. So that's a lot to unpack. Um, I want to remain hopeful and hopefully people will will be open to having discourse. I think we are too much into echo chambers too, even amongst our side and we don't want to listen to others. And that doesn't make you any less conservative for wanting to have dialogue. But I think sometimes we get stuck in our little, I would say organs of, of echo chambers and we don't do much to reach out to other people. And I think in the conservative media ecosystem too, we used to be really good at this, but we're all divided. We're competing for clicks and likes and hits and things of that sort. And I think we have to kind of think beyond that. Yeah, so that's a good place, I think, to wrap up our conversation. Covered a lot of ground there, but I, I think it, it was great. Everybody, if you're interested in checking out Gabriella's work and her podcast, the links will all be in the show description. But just to wrap out the show, hit us with your most controversial food opinion. Ooh, okay. You may share this opinion, actually. But I think stemming back from my upbringing and because quality of food and quality of life was not the best, I am one of those people, and I know some of my fellow hunters may lambast me for this, but I have to have my meat, whether it's beef or wild game, I have to eat it on the more well done side because I just can't stand yeah. the taste. <laughs> I cannot stand the taste of too bloodied of meat. And I know that's sacrilegious for me to say. I don't have it like where it's rubber and disgusting. Um, I could probably do the least like a little bit pink, but it has to be very minuscule. But I tend to eat my burgers, especially on the well done side and my steak. If I do eat steak, it has to be more on the well done side. And do you put ketchup on it? No, I put ranch. <laughs> Sorry, I disagree with you. <laughs> you put it on steak? Right? Yeah, ranch is good on steak. Yeah. I want to try sriracha. that. that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, don't think those steaks are hot at all, but people, no. some people will. All right. Uh, Gabriella, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Brad. Good to talk to you.